Good afternoon. I can't see you, to be fairly honest. <laughs> but I can hear you. I hope so. Thank you. Right. Um, I'm here today more or less on behalf of the European Society of Anesthesiology, but I'm giving you my perspective. And I hope you don't mind. I walk a little bit around. I hope you can still hear me. I don't have anything written down, but I would like to start with a little story. And imagine, go back in the 50s. In 1952, there was a large polymyelitis epidemia in Copenhagen. Over 5,700 people were registered and came to one hospital. And almost two and a half thousand patients were experiencing respiratory or bulbar failure. So basically, they weren't able to breathe anymore. Can you imagine this? And the hospital was equipped only with one iron lung and six cuirass respirators. That's it. So can you imagine seven devices versus two and a half thousand patients? needing these devices. It's, it's impossible. What a disaster. And now I would like to share with you a true story. And it's the original notes of Vivi. Vivi is a 12-year-old girl who also has been admitted to the hospital with fever and paralysis. And you see on the right side, if you go to the Copenhagen ar archive, you can find these notes. So this girl was basically doomed to die, couldn't breathe anymore. And there was one clever guy, Dr. Ibsen. He was the first anesthetist of Denmark. But I'll let you know he was trained in the US. And he saw all the problems. All the children, young people were dying because they haven't had any idea how to treat it. So he thought we do a tracheotomy, that means a little hole here in the neck region, and put a tube in and ventilate the patients. So the whole group in the hospital said, wow, that's quite interesting approach and attempt. They all went to the room where this little girl was waiting, and then they put some local anesthetic there, and the girl, she went into mucosin, into spasm, went pale, went blue, and was, was basically almost dying. So all the people, all the group of doctors and so on, left the room because they said, oh, she will die anyway. The only person who stayed in the room was the anesthetist, Dr. Ibsen. And he injected 100 milligram of cyapentyl. The tracheotomy could be, or was performed, and the girl was ventilated and she survived. That is the start. This is an amazing story. And this tells you now where we're going to head. Because can you imagine 300 cases of polio every week in one hospital? The mortality rate was 90%. And the, uh, the guy, Dr. Ibsen, had the idea, let's put a little hole in the neck and ventilate them. But there was further ideas, because number one, they recruited 1,500 medical students. And these students, they did nothing else than for 286 days, having a little bag in their hand and ventilating patients. 165,000 ventilation hours. It's unbelievable. But what do you think? What happened with the mortality? We're here at a patient safety movement meeting. It went down to 25%. Is this not amazing? 90 to 25? And you see the little picture here on the right side. This was a, this was a reality at the time. So patients were conscious. They were laughing, they were smiling, but they were just unable to move and to breathe. And you see the little box here? So the medical students had on one hand a little back ventilating, on the other hand, they were reading children books and so on. So I think it's just an amazing story. But 
the birth of intensive care medicine is not only related to this story, it's a little bit more, because even at the time, intensive care medicine, or the birth, was really lucky. Why was it lucky? Because there were three guys, Astrup, Sigurd, Anderson, Severinghaus, who invented the pH, PCO2, and oxygen electrodes. But why did they develop it? For medicine? No, not for medicine. It was for the Danish brewing industry. And you know, all know Carlsberg, that's a beer company. They're producing beer. So they were developing something for a completely different purpose. But then it was used for medicine. And suddenly, long-term ventilation was now possible. And I would like to read to you this sentence, because Dr. Ibsen said, if a patient comes now to my intensive care unit, the patient needs to be moribund. So he was saying, I wanted to make sure that if the patient recovered, it would be recognized as due to our treatment. And if that, if he did not recover, our treatment would not be blamed. So the lessons to be learned is the history of intensive care medicine, at least in Europe, should not be forgotten. And Dr. Ibsen had the idea that patient care on a unit like this needs to be excellent. And he said, one patient, one nurse in a dedicated ward. We have heard today that cutting costs means taking a little bit of stuff out, less nurses, less doctors. This is not a solution and definitely not for patient safety. So in 1953, the speciality of intensive care was born. And my statement is a very strong one at the end of my slide. Anesthesia and intensive care medicine cannot be separated from each other. And I'm standing here as a representative for the European Society of Anesthesiology, and this will be further developed in our society. So what else stands our society for at, it's very simple, we treat patients and we want to make sure that they're safe so patient safety in anesthesiology is one of the major aims and goals within Europe. And I would like to give you this example. The five R's. The right drug, the right route, the right time, the right dose, the right patient. I'm very positive. That's the reason why I'm saying this. I don't, I'm not negative. I don't want to say the wrong drug, the wrong route, the wrong time, the wrong dose, the wrong patient. That's awful. No, the right things to do. And it's important that we use standardized syringe labels. And I hope you all do this in your hospitals, because this prevents patient dramas, patient damage, deaths, whatsoever. So this is just an example how things could work. But I also would like to talk about what our society is promoting, clinical research. And a very good example is the APRICOT trial, Anesthesia Practice in Children Observational Trial. This was being carried out in Europe, with over 30,000 children have been observed with the age of 0 to 15. And the hypothesis was to study the incidence of severe critical events. And in children, it's like laryngo and bronchospasm, aspiration, neurological damage, cardiac arrest, death, and so on. And if you look at the numbers now, it's quite worrying, because severe critical events, 5.2%. And all-cause 30-day in-hospital mortality, one in a thousand. And this was independent of the type of anesthesia. So what can we learn from this? Education, education. We have to improve quality in pediatric anesthesia. And this is a difficult task. But children are not half adults. No, they're very special, they're very particular, and they need special care from specialists. And this needs education, but needs also awareness. So I would like to give you an example from our own hospital. What you see on the left side is theater, you see a ventilator, and you see this little glass pitcher. This has been developed from one of our consultants, and it's basically glass, 
And before anesthesia is being carried out, the team has to stand still and to write down all the relevant things which might be important for anesthesia. So it's weight, different doses of medication, and you see the labels here are also the same labels also on the syringes. So to make sure that no mistake can happen if a situation is not going straight forward. And it needs to be signed by the anesthetist and signed by the consultant, just to make sure safety is present. It can be wiped after that, so it can be reused. The other thing what we have introduced is anesthesia trolleys. And an anesthesia trolley with medication for adults cannot be used for children. Therefore, we're using these nice pinkish ones for children. So it's a completely different setup. And it's a commitment from us to make sure that we are not providing situations where doctors can make mistakes. And we want to see happy babies. This is actually is my daughter, but this is five years ago. Right. The next thing I would like to talk briefly about, uh, you have heard it already, is anemia. Anemia is a decrease in the total amount of red blood cells or hemoglobin in the blood. And we all know patients are coming to the hospital to be treated, to be healed. But I'm telling you something, you can agree or disagree with me, the biggest enemy of a patient is the hospital, unfortunately. So we have to make the big enemy safe. Why do we have to do this? Because I'm saying the biggest enemy because the patient is coming already with anemia and we are making it worse. So we have to change this. So why is anemia so bad, especially in the preoperative setting? So if you're coming to have elective surgery, we know now that anemia is associated with a 20% longer hospital stay, a two-fold increased risk of infection, a four times increased risk of kidney injury, a three-fold increased risk of mortality, and five times increased risk of transfusion. So why do we allow patients for elective surgery to be anemic? This is a no-go. And that's the reason why we have the EPS number five, that we prevent this. We have to stand up as a hospital, as health professionals, not allowing this to, hap to happen. Now I will be a little bit provocative, and I would like to get you into a different thinking. We all respect the WHO, the World Health Organization. They're doing brilliant work, fantastic job. But if you look at this here, you have children, you have women, you have men, and we have hemoglobin thresholds. And these thresholds are being used to say a person is anemic or not anemic. And if you look at this, women not pregnant, they say it's 12 and men 13. These numbers and data are about 60 years old. And what it does, I'll show you with the next slide. So now imagine you're part of a team operating in the theater. And you have on one side a young man. His hemoglobin is 13, so he's by definition not anemic. His blood volume is 6.5 liters, and he is undergoing surgery and losing one liter of blood. His hemoglobin is going down to 11. Second situation, a young lady, or an elderly lady in this case, hemoglobin is 12. She's not anemic by definition. But her blood volume is only 2.6 liters. She's tiny, she's small, and she also bleeds one liter, and her hemoglobin is seven. What do you think is the difference now? It's very simple. The lady will be transfused. Everything is the same. Same operation, same surgeon, same amount of blood loss, but this lady needs to be transfused. What can we change? And I'm telling you what we need to do is we have to treat men and women equal. Why should we put women in a, I would say, in a bad situation before we even do surgery? And that's what I'm showing you here. We call it version 4.0 for planned surgery. And what you see here is 
We do not make any difference anymore between men and women on the hemoglobin concentration. So I believe we as men have to carry women on our arms. We have to treat them like queens at home and in the hospital. I hope you agree with me. So, <laughs> translating this now in the real world is the following. So if we agree, women should have a hemoglobin also of 13. The blood volume stays the same, the same amount of blood has been lost, and suddenly the hemoglobin is 8. And that means no transfusion. And as you know, transfusion has a lot of risk. And I don't want that our better side in the human race is being harmed by something which is unnecessary. Implementing patient blood management has a huge impact on patients. And some years ago here, the patient safety movement, we presented the work. And it's very simple. Optimize hemoglobin, use blood sparing techniques, and use standardized transfusion protocols. And you need at least 20% less transfusion, and you have a reduction in complications. So there's no way out of not using patient blood management. I don't know who has been in theater the last five years, but it has changed dramatically. This is modern anesthesia. This is actually in one of our theaters in Frankfurt. You see the person in green, that's the anesthetist, and he's surrounded by a lot of medical devices helping to make better medicine. But sometimes we forget the patient. The patient is right here. There's the patient. And as you can see, it's very technical. So we need industry to help us to get all the information together to make better decisions. The same thing on the intensive care unit. There's a patient on our unit. And again, you see, he's surrounded by lots of things. And I'm highlighting it. The patient is on a ventilator. The patient is monitored. The patient is on a huge battery of drugs being perfused in the body. Unfortunately, the kidneys are not working anymore, so we have dialysis. Um, we have a weakness of the heart. There's a balloon pump in the patient. And last, the patient is also on an ECMO to provide further oxygen for the circulation. This is the medicine surrounding we're experiencing every day. And this is also something that the European Society of Anesthesiology is facing. How do we get our trainees into this? How do we make sure that they know what to do and they're confident in what they're doing? And I would like to come to a trial which the European Society of Anesthesiology has carried out together with the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. It's a European Surgical Outcome Study. And almost 500 hospitals have been involved in 28 countries. And 46,000 uh, patients have been admitted, uh, no, were involved. And 77% of these have been ad admitted to critical care. And the mortality is interesting. If it were elective, 3.2%. Emergencies, almost 10%. However, 73% of deaths have never been admitted to critical care, demonstrating that if a country, if a hospital has not this facility, patients will have bad outcome. So I'm promoting to have enough critical care capacities to treat patients in the case of elective or emergency. And what is also interesting in this study, you can see here, is this the adjusted odds ratio, the outcome. So if you use the reference, this is United Kingdom, it's right in the middle. If you have countries on the right side, you can see patients had a worse outcome. If you go to the left side, patients had a better, out, uh, better outcome. So there's a huge variety in providing proper care, and especially in intensive care medicine. 
So we should be aware of that there's a lot of things which need to be done in terms of training, but also in terms of how medicine is being implemented in intensive care. I'm coming to a point which is, in my eyes, absolutely important, training. And I have used the word preparing for the future. We have not so many very, very young people here. I know this today, some in the first uh, lane here. But medicine is a great, great um, field. And going to medical school is fun on one side. On the other side, you're being prepared for real life. But we have a change, at least in Europe. Our young people are not anymore prepared to work as much as we did. And they also are, I think, extremely clever because they were growing up with computers. They were growing up with electronic uh, learning skills and so on and so on. And they have valid points. They say, we have a family, shift work is not good, it's unhealthy for us, on calls is unhealthy, and I would like to be at Christmas, Easter, and Thanksgiving at home. It makes sense. It makes sense to all of us, I think. On the other side, we have to consider this and how do we provide health care for our patients if the young people do not want to work anymore on these particular days? Do you have any ideas? <laughs> so that brings me to a point, and which is intensive care medicine. As you know, in intensive care medicine, you have to work day in, day out, 24-7. You're working in shifts. In my department, on the intensive care unit, our doctors are working 12-hour shifts. So they have one week they're working four days, and the other week they're working three days. And it's not very helpful to have a family or a girlfriend or boyfriend because they think it's crazy. But we know that the uh, number of intensive care beds are increasing in Europe. And they have to increase because our society is getting older. So how do we want to run these uh, beds? when we have less people who would like to work on intensive care medicine. So the only option I personally see is we have to have models where we have young doctors working on the intensive care unit for a certain time and then doing something else and coming back. And this model, I think, is only being possible by combining anesthesia and intensive care medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've given you a very, very, hopefully nice insight about the European society, what we're planning to do. This is just on the surface, but it tells you we care for patient safety, we care for our patients, but also you need to know it is sometimes extremely difficult if a patient comes to you and you induce anesthesia and the patient never wakes up again then you know something needs to be done. And I'm very grateful today for the platform I have here to present the European Society. And I would like to say for the first time today, thank you to the family behind Joe Chiani, because without the family behind, all these things wouldn't be possible as well, and especially your wife. And um, yes, I hope you enjoyed this. And if there's any questions later on in the evening, please come to me. Thank you very much.